who is going to talk to us about Agile retrospectives. So without further ado, Enrico. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Enrico. As some of you might know, I'm from Italy. And for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Agile retrospectives. At the end of this talk, you should be able to adjust uh, your current retrospectives with some new practice or to, to start a new structure entirely. At Pivotal, we run retrospectives every week for about an hour. Um, raise your hand if you've been in a Pivotal retrospective before. OK, so not everyone has. And I gave this talk before, but since there are like always new clients and new pivots coming in, uh, I wanted to, to give it again. So it's a little bit different than the other, side, the other times. So our retrospective purpose uh, is to learn what went well and what didn't, and to adjust uh, our iteration to make it better, to improve what didn't go well, and to cherish what did. At Pivotal, we spend an hour like gathering data and trying to decide what to do. Also drinking beer, we run retrospectives at the end of the week, so it's kind of like a relaxing environment. And we use a format where we have an happy, meh, and sad column. And we collect those items, and we have a facilitator that try to guide the team in finding out what can be improved about some of those. One of the uh, issues that, that can happen when you run the same retrospective format over and over again is that your brain might get uh, kind of like get used to it too much. And last night I was Googling this uh, phenomenon called uh, semantic satiation. And it's basically when you say a word, if I start saying lemon, 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 it will start making sense to your brain. It will just become a noise. And that's what semantic satiation is. So it's good to switch up uh, formats even when they work. And again, at Pivotal, we do an excellent job with the format we have, especially thanks to, to Pivotal that uh, influence and make it interesting and, and, and uh, always different. So riding a train, you would imagine, is, must be a lot of fun. Uh, can anyone tell what that little pedal is on 45? Accelerator, wrong. Any other take? <laughs> It's a good one. Break? Anyone? It's a. So, no. It's actually a safety device. So, when you're riding the train as a driver, it turns out it can be pretty boring to drive, a, especially an Amtrak commuter train. And so, that kind of like tells if the, if the driver is awake or not and stop the train to prevent incidents. But if you drive a Shinkansen, a Japanese bullet train, it's so exciting because you're going at 500 kilometers an hour. So you don't need any, any pedal, maybe? It actually does have a pedal down there. So every retrospective format you use, you'll still want to change it. Your brain will still get used to it. And you want to make sure that, as a facilitator, you're making your uh, team engaged. Ultimately, do what works. And I'm going to tell you about. Uh, a couple of episodes where I've used the mad, sad, glad retrospective and it didn't work out very well and how I tackled that situation. In some case, those uh, retrospective became someone's agenda. Someone would, like a director or a CTO, would walk in our retrospective and put an item on the board and hijack the retrospective and start talking about it. Other times, a single topic would become a conversation between a product owner and uh, a tech lead. And again, that was the retrospective. So a structured retrospective is a little bit harder to hijack. And we'll see why in a few moments. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to use as an example a project that uh, I was on in, uh, in Colorado for Pivotal. The project was fairly challenging. Uh, the team, the client team, was using a very interesting merge strategy. We needed to use RSA IDs to log into a couple of VPNs. 
they had an integration named after a terrorist organization. And they had a lot of integrations that were always out of place. And so at the end of the week, the team was always kind of worn out. And the MedSec Glad retrospective had a lot of unhappy events, some of which were outside of our control. The action item uh, were many, and sometimes we couldn't follow up, giving a sense of frustration. And that's the worst thing that you can get out of your retrospective, having a feeling that nothing was achieved, that you kind of wasted an hour. And this happened um, to me before in a different environment where people were hijacking the retrospective. But in this case, we were not hijacking the retrospective. There was just so much happening, and it felt like we were not uh, getting anywhere. And so I was leading the team, and I decided to introduce the structure the retrospective. And what it is is a retrospective based on a couple of books, one, which we have in our library, by the way, uh, one by Derby and Larson, primarily, and the one by Norman Kurth. Dividing the hour allocated to the retrospective in those five uh, activities. And trying to get one thing out of the retrospective. So instead of multiple action items, the objective was to get one actionable experiment that we would make part of our flow and in the company I worked for in New York, it was something as simple as starting stand up on time. Uh, at the time, like, people were frustrated. And what came out of it, people also didn't feel confident and safe to talk about. Another thing that usually people doesn't happen, we make our retrospective safe. But you might know someone that doesn't work for Pivotal or at Pivotal in an environment that is not safe. So we'll see how the structure retrospective helps with that. But yeah. The take out of the retrospective was something as simple as let's start, stand up at nine, regardless of who's there. The first thing is set the stage to make sure everyone understands what a retrospective is about. Has any of you heard of um, Kurt's Prime Directive before? Awesome. So Kurt is uh, the creator of retrospective, as we know. And the Prime Directive is something that he used to state at the beginning of retrospectives. And he says that regardless of what we discover, we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could given what they knew at the time, their skills and abilities, and the situation at hand. Now, at the beginning of the retro, you ask your team as a facilitator, you ask them to give a verbal yes. Yes, that's what we believe. And now in this sentence, there is so much inside of it. We believe that everyone did the best job they could, given what they knew at the time. Well, maybe Marvin didn't know about that integration being down that day. Their skills and ability, well, maybe Matt has only got two weeks of JavaScript experience. That's why the code is so bad and the resources available. So making sure that everyone understands that sets a good stage, a good first, uh, first step in the retrospective. If people don't want to do that, if people don't want to put aside their uh, biases, then you're going to have a hard retrospective. And you probably shouldn't go ahead. Make sure that people are OK putting aside their uh, biases, at least for the sake of the retrospective. Another interesting uh, activity to do is the ESVP. It's an anonymous activity. So people that don't feel safe uh, are anonymous and just express how they feel about the retrospective. Which role fits you uh, in this retrospective? Do you feel like an explorer, someone that wants to make the most out of the retrospective, leave no stone unturned? Or at the opposite side, a prisoner, someone that is, has been forced to be in this retrospective? And tracking down those roles and asking how are those roles based uh, reflecting our work day to day helps seeing uh, and making sure that everyone is engaged during retrospectives. If you have a room full of prisoners, you should not run the retrospective. There is a bigger problem, maybe someone in the room, uh, that make people feel uncomfortable. So after you've done that, 20 minutes to gathering data. And uh, uh, here we usually collect data during, uh, during the retrospective day. What we did for that on that team in, in Colorado, we used a, a continuous timeline. So we had the team was collocated, so we had we had our continuous timeline, and people would add post-it notes to meaningful events that would happen during the week. 
as well as uh, artifacts, like a little chocolate that someone brought back from Italy. And it wasn't me. I'm not the only one going to Italy. It was someone with an Italian wife. Another flavor of that continuous timeline was color-coded. And the purpose for that was to run a project retrospective and run a, a timeline for the whole project and see how the mood changed uh, during, uh, during those weeks. It also, during that time, during collecting data, you, as a team, you let your team look at what everyone else put on the board and you add new things in case there are uh, topics that someone wants to discuss and bring up at, during that time. And after that's done, you start, you spend the next 15 minutes generating insight, trying to understand and find patterns on those items. So rather than taking them one by one, let's try and looking for an overarching problem or on something that connects multiple things. And this is something that you, as a facilitator, let your team do. So you're not going to drive and move things around. You're going to have your team go to the board and move things around, find those overarching problems. And ultimately, a vote to find out which one is more important to the whole team. Once that's found, it's time to decide what to do, making something actionable, an experiment. In the team in Colorado, an, an example was having an hypothesis that uh, some of the merge problems we were having was because some of the client developers were off-site and we never communicated with them. And so the experiment was to have the client developers participate, the pivotal stand-up, and to communicate with client developers through uh, FlowDoc, which is the chat room, when introducing new patterns. And we had some measurements to see if that was successful or not. How many times did we pair? And how many times did they join our stand-up? And how many merge conflicts were requiring merge parties, which was as fun as it sounds. The experiment was put on the board so that everyone could sit during the week and keep track of what was going on. One thing that I love about the continuous timeline is that you can have those artifacts. This bag here, we had a, some sort of gas leakage in our team area. And it was like a smelly gas. We didn't know what it was. And when we called uh, facilities, uh, by the time they came, the smell was gone. So one of my colleagues took a zip bag when the smell was there, kind of got the, the smell inside, it zipped it. And then when the facility person came, he said, it's here, the smell is here, do you want to smell it? And so I think it's kind of funny to, to have it uh, as, a, as a place to leave artifacts about, how, about the team experiences. Now, someone might be angry by the fact that your retrospective only tackles one experiment, one item. And if that happens, that is definitely an advantage of the uh, classic retrospective format that we have a pivot. It tackles things one by one and everyone feels heard. With a more structured retrospective, you can remind your team that if that point is important, it will come back if it's important to the team. So make sure that uh, perhaps you alternate the two type of retrospectives. And the last 10 minutes were dedicated to team appreciation. So during, the, um, during collecting data, we would have a rule of no naming, no blaming. And the last 10 minutes was just about positive things. And 10 minutes seems like a short time, but it's a long time. And sometimes there were long silences. Silence and time to give people to think about stuff that happened. And it was really, really good to, to spend those 10 minutes. And in this case, we had some, the developers were off size, so we would give, we would write on a piece of paper the appreciation for that developer uh, to, bring, to bring back to the, to, the, um, to the clients. I hope you will at least use one of those activities during your retrospective. Maybe you will open with Kurt's Prime Directive. Maybe you will close with team appreciation, or you will make an experiment actionable, or maybe generate insight or a continuous timeline in your next retrospective. Thank you for listening, and I'm here for questions if you have any.
Let's get an idea about how the discussion is managed. So, so the gathering data, for example, um, can you talk about some of the mechanics of how that happens? And sure. specifically part of what I'm really kind of driving at is how do you how do you help keep the team focused on those specific activities that is gathering data or generating insights as opposed to jumping to deciding like, well, we should do this, we should create such and yeah, so did everyone hear the question? Okay. Uh, I don't hear no, so I assume yes. I used the timer to like make sure that things were on time. So one of those little uh, time timers. So having that, uh, making that visible to the team uh, to make sure that everyone understands there's 20 minutes, the time is going, so we are about to finish this activity. We're going to move on soon. Uh, one thing that I kind of like concealed is that the hour that I split up actually needed some padding in between activities. Uh, so instead of the full hour, it might be like an hour and 10 minutes because you need to transition from one activity to the next one. Um, usually people would, uh, would uh, be engaged into, into those activities because they were different. And so kind of like saying, now we need to move on to something else uh, was was a, a good way to, to transition. Does that answer your question? Yeah, did you, did you have people go up and write things on the board and describe it as they write them? And they brainstorm independently and about the board? It was more like, so the duplicate power was kind of like handled by the fact that it was kind of like on the board. It was more like an event rather than, the retro we do here is more like, because it was on a timeline, something might have happened on Tuesday and then again on Friday. Like uh, integration X is down. But it's on two days, so it's, uh, it was kind of like an event that happened twice. And then people would just go there and like think about those events. So you would gather around the, the timeline and talk about that. Maybe put on new, new things. So you remember there was this other thing that happened on Tuesday. Maybe Someone didn't put it there. In some case, we had a product owner that wasn't on site, so he would like do it during retrospective, put those events. Um, yeah. Any other question? Mike. How much of the, the facilitation was done this internally? Like, some of this action sounds like similar to activities that you would see in like. Uh, or other things where you could have outside um, facilitation to help guide it where they know enough about the process but have no stake in what's going on. Did yeah. you deal with that or did you just like isolate yourself? Yeah, unfortunately, like, it was like handled by, I, I always was part of the team when I was facilitating those retros. So I, I write in this book about saying this phrase about now I'm taking my facilitator ad off and I'm going to speak as a developer. Because obviously, like, when you say, you, you probably have a state, you want to voice something. So it's doing that kind of helps the, the team to understand that you are there in two roles. At the same time, the ideal scenario is something that we actually talked about, having like a facilitator, facilitator coming from a different team uh, to have like a, to not have a stake and to have like a clear uh, kind of like mindset. Having, Nevertheless, the downside to that is you need preparation. So when, you have, when you're an external facilitator, you can't just go in cold. And that's one of the advantages of our retrospective. There isn't like a lot of preparation. We just go in and we put things on the board. But in more structured ones, the, it's, it's interesting to find out how many points did you achieve last week and uh, what are the, the issues. Having like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with developers for a few minutes just to understand what's going on. In general, there is always preparation required for structured retrospectives. Um, in one of those books, I think Larson says, you will never go down to zero. You might start from spending as much as half an hour to prepare a, an hour retrospective, but you'll never go down, and you'll reduce that as you get more and more um, experience, but you'll never go down to zero. There's always needs to, to prepare something. Um, any other question? Yes, so all this is primarily for co-located retrospectives, 
remote retrospective is a completely different beast. And post facto worked well for those environments where we had people that were not in the same room. Uh, one thing I highly dislike is the lack of being able to group things and to assign a number of votes. There is another app called Retrium that allows you to do those two things. Is not, and I've used it in a remote project I was on. And the downside is it's not very as, uh, as mobile friendly as PostFactor. PostFactor is very easy to use on a phone, so that's, that's really great. Uh, I think starting with it is, is awesome. Any other question? All right. Thank you, everyone.